Welcome back to another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, and today I am pleased and honored to have in the, I, I guess I can say still newly acclaimed leader, because it is still relatively new in the grand scheme of things, the newly acclaimed leader of the Saskatchewan Liberal Party, uh, Jeff Walters. Jeff, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor and a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Chris. I really do appreciate it, and I'm happy to be on. Um, so, Jeff, uh, any politician that comes on my show starts off with the exact same question. Where does your sense of duty to serve come from? Um, that's actually um, a tangible question for me. Uh, it really came about, for the most part, uh, about two years ago. I have five kids. One of my uh, children is uh, my daughter um, has special needs. She has juvenile Parkinson's. And it took us several years to get that diagnosis. It's very rare. Going through the healthcare system here in Saskatchewan, being just frustrated at how things have degraded, especially with healthcare. And I sat down one day, my father-in-law told me, if you want to do something, quit complaining, get off the couch and actually do it. And so that really was the catalyst for me um, to try and do my part. It's easy for us to sit and complain, but it's another thing to stand up and actually try and do something. So that's really where it comes from for me personally. And now, why the Saskatchewan Liberals, though? Because some people will say, why, why choose one party over another? And for you, as the new leader, why the Saskatchewan Liberals? It's because I'm a liberal. It makes the most sense. Um, I'm not here for power or money. Um, I don't need that. I'm here because I want to be here. And I'm a centrist. I'm a, I like to call myself a radical centrist. That's, that's where I am. I'm the person that would rather have the best minds in the room and hammer out some, some type of collaboration and cooperation. But we can't let the enemy be the perfect of the good. And so if we can get stuff that helps the vast majority of people in this province, that trumps any type of ideology that I bring up. And that's where I am to the core. Now, the liberals in Saskatchewan, for those who might not know, have been kind of uh, in a weird position. They haven't had a sitting MLA for some time, since 2003, if I'm not mistaken. What brings you into the fold to say, I can do it? I can bring the party that was kind of the former like power base of the province to relevant, re relevance once again? Well, it's just a sense of oneself that I know I can do it precisely because that classic case when you set your mind to it, you can do anything, <laughs> that type of thing. <clears throat> but it really comes down to just confidence in yourself and your abilities and having the will to do it. I know that's not even just in our party. Many people run because, well, for many reasons, and one, because it's easy if they're with the governing party, or two, as a bucket list thing. That's not what it's about for me. So when I choose to engage, which is rare, I am all in. And so at this point of time, I'm with the party, with myself, I am all in. I'm going to do my best to reinvigorate this party. That's where what it, what it comes down to. It's just a sense of knowing oneself more than anything else. Now, we have a lot of policy questions that we want to talk about uh, in, the, um, in the interview, whether it be COVID-19, inflation, immigration. Um, but I, I still want to stick to the party here right now. And that is, as the new leader, your job now is basically to crisscross the province to talk to Saskatchewan residents, to hear from them directly. Because if a leader isn't doing that, they're doing a, a bad job, in my opinion. So in your time since October, when you were uh, uh, elected as the new leader, what have you heard from Saskatchewan residents? What are on the minds of the people of Saskatchewan right now? Well, I'm really glad you mentioned that, especially with regards to engaging with voters. One of the first things we did once I was acclaimed, um, in fact, the first two months was doing what we call the listening tour um, across Saskatchewan. And we hit places that, the places that basically a liberal, especially a provincial liberal, has not been in decades. And there's always this myth that somehow, you know, that's, you know, SAS party territory or that's NDP territory. Um, I don't ascribe to that. Uh, you're not going to win or do anything if you don't show up, you know, and that's the key to that. And even though when we went to places where liberals were well, either a dirty name or haven't been around for a while, there was a sense of, for most people that we talked to, of appreciation that they don't agree with us necessarily, but just being there, being heard, that's something that goes a long way. We've come to the point in this province where we have a good chunk of the province in of itself that really is one party territory now because 
The two main parties over the past 20 years have been the NDP and the SAS party. We have this binary system. And the NDP has gone to where their base is. The SAS party goes to where their base is. And that's about it. And I really want and am aiming to change that. So I don't care if there had liberals never been voted in certain constituencies, I'm gonna be there. And if they decide, even one person decides to wanna to come talk to me, I'm good with that. So that's where we're at. And we don't have to win everything. And that's not the goal. It's just to be heard and to listen to people. So segueing back to your question, what have I heard? Precisely anathema of our politics. We've had in 2020, the last election we had, one of the lowest turnouts in a generation. 48% of voters just didn't show up. And that's almost unheard of in Saskatchewan. And that's telling that when people don't bother showing up, the implication is that either their vote doesn't matter or they just don't have a choice. So they just sit it out. So we have the base of the two parties of the binary that still show up, but more and more people aren't. And so that's where we are. And we can argue, you know, politics necessarily, we can argue ideologies, left or right, what's good or bad, but really we want people to engage. And that's how democracy thrives. That's the health of our democracy. I, I appreciate what you said about going into places where traditionally liberals or any other party don't, don't do well. Because when I, I lived in Saskatchewan for five years, and I, I remember uh, covering Saskatchewan politics in the Lloydminster area, and I can tell you that the one common thing that I heard over and over again was, we elect our representatives, they go off to Regina, and we never see them again until the next election. Understandable, Lloydminster to Regina, I did that uh, drive a few times, and it is a gong show of just, if you don't have a good radio signal, you're not going to get good music on this car stereo. So how do you do that differently? Because being a leader outside of the legislature right now is easy, easy for you to get involved and get out there and actually talk to residents where MLAs are going to be stuck in Regina advocating for the residents. When you're talking to Saskatchewan residents, are you, are they saying we haven't seen a politician outside of an election? Because that's what I heard when I was in Saskatchewan. It's entirely true. Um, they have limited choice or feel they have limited choice and that choice that they have, they feel abandoned. And that goes a long way when you have a single party and, you know, Alberta, aside from when they got elected, you kind of understand the same thing. We have a party that's basically been a ruling party for so long. There's a sense of hubris that goes in the air. And in that particular case, the party in many cases starts to detach from the very people that elected them. And we can have that sense. And it just, I'm not saying that the SAS party is evil or bad or anything like that. It's just, it comes with the territory of being in power for so long. And that's why, despite being in power for so long, there's always that change. There's always those notebooks. There's always those other ones that come along and shake up the system. And so when I hear people being detached from their MLAs because they go to Regina or whatnot, I'm thinking, this is the 21st century. We don't necessarily have to physically be with somebody at their door to communicate with. Now, and that's one thing that we learned in the whole COVID era. I teach at a university oh, for two years. We weren't in person. We were in Zoom and other communications. We don't have to physically be there anymore. And so that old excuse where, you know, I'd love to meet my constituents, but I'm sorry, I have to sit in the legislature. Here's the thing. You're in the legislature very rarely because there's not a whole lot of sessions. And also, welcome to the 21st century, my friend. We have communications now that are much modern. So I don't really subscribe to that. And that's what I've been telling people too. And letting people know, they have my email, they have my phone number, they have all of my information, I'm there. Now, I might not be able to pick up the phone that second, but rest assured, I'll get a hold of you. And it doesn't matter if I'm elected or not. And that comes from my own experience of being an instructor and professor, being in charge of three, 400 students a semester, that it's our job to get back to them. It's our job to ensure that they have information. Being a politician, especially an elected one, is no different. It's your job. That's what you're paid to do. When you're crossing the uh, province and talking during that listening tour, and even now, I'm assuming you're still out there. Might not now because you're in the middle of a, a storm, as you said in our pre-interview. <laughs> but uh, what values are you talking about? What values does the, the Saskatchewan Liberal Party represent? And when you when you talk to people about those values, are people 
open to listening because we find ourselves in a very polarized uh, uh, year uh, with Twitter, with social media. And when having a conversation with somebody, it can open people's eyes. So what values are you saying? And are people open to hearing them? It's interesting you say that because especially with the trucker convoy or whatnot, it was kind of emblematic of how polarized we've become. And because I'm a SAS liberal, there's always the implication of tying this to federal liberals. And especially during the whole trucker convoy, um, whatever you want to call it, phenomenon, um, there was a lot of um, anxiety and animosity thrown in my direction by virtue of what the federal government happened to be doing. And it is what it is, right? People associate in those certain ways. And you know, that's something that we as a party have kind of neglected for many years. And we've allowed our opponents to define us. And we've lost control of our narrative. And so when that happens, of course, there's going to be connections. And of course, there's going to be a lot of things that come up that simply aren't true. That's one of the things I bring back is reclaiming our narrative. But what I've been saying and what I've been talking with people is using what us centrists and moderates talk about, common sense government that makes sense for everybody. I'm not there as a SAS liberal. I'm there as a citizen of Saskatchewan who is utterly convinced that we can do better than what we've been seeing. And that's something that, again, many people in Saskatchewan are very attuned with. I mean, we have, of course, the NDP who are NDP and they do what they do, but certain things they tend to ignore. Um, the economy is exactly one thing that they tend to, in many ways, um, not really are strong with regard to policy. Then we have the SAS party who has their strengths and their weaknesses with regard to what they ignore and what they don't. And they tend to be very ideological. And in many cases, they allow their ideology to dictate. So it could be a good idea, but because it comes from this side, they can't touch it. I'm saying, I don't care where it comes from. If it, even if it comes from the Buffalo party, if it's a good idea, we can at least entertain the idea of listening to it. That's common sense because they're not there to represent their party. They're there to represent people and not everybody voted for them. Why so they are. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow up on that, and I apologize for interrupting. I don't like interrupting during these interviews, but I want to follow up on that. Do you find that the current leadership in Saskatchewan with Scott Moe and, well, not Ryan Miley, but the potentially new NDP leader, but he is the NDP leader right now, is just focused on their base and they're not yes. listening to the other side? Absolutely. And we see this from Scott Moe, the premier. Um, especially since the 2020 election with uh, the rise of the Buffalo Party. That, of course, used to be their far right, part of their far right voter base. And we've seen um, what he's come out with, um, trying to appease them more and more by going in that direction. The entire point, of course, is to try and get them back into you know, the SAS party base. And that tells you a couple of things. It tells you, one, that you know, their ideology, they are trying to, of course, go after that um, really that base that really has been cut off from them. And the Buffalo Party has kind of trumped them on that. But two, it, it is kind of a implicitly um, telling the voters and people who are paying attention that they don't really fear their opposition, that they can go further from the center. Um, they made the calculated decision to do that and you know, risk alienating those you know, center right soft supporters. They made that calculated decision that it's more profitable for them to go further right. For people like us, centrists, I mean, it's even more alienating because how the SAS party came to be was precisely them pretending to be center rights moderates. And so the further right they go, the more that people who have been voting for them this whole time blindly because they're the center right option are staying home. Hence why we have the lower and lower voter turnout. A classic example, the Athabasca by-election just in January, February rather, the turnout was 24%. Now think about that for a second, 24%. And yes, it was a by-election. Yes, it was in the far north in winter. However, 24%, and that's telling you something. It's telling you and suggesting that people are just not happy with the politics and they're not gonna bother. And so, yes, I see that both parties in the binary right now are in fact entrenching their base to the exclusion of those in the center and those people that just want common sense government. 
We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. Now, I, I don't want to, I, I want to talk about the Athabasca by-election here for a second, and I don't want to do the gotcha question because I hate them and I despise them, but I got to ask the, 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 the million dollar question is the Saskatchewan Liberals didn't run a candidate. Um, so. talk, you're talking about getting out there and running and talking to people in each part of the, uh, the province. Um, what, what happened there? Was it just you didn't have time or what, why, why weren't you able to get a candidate up in Athabasca during that by-election? It wasn't much about not being able, more about being, having a calculated decision. That we sat down and we said, can we bring somebody viable enough to make a difference in Athabasca? And if not, what are our options? We couldn't at that time be able to do so. And so our options was just to parachute somebody in or a paper candidate, but that's insulting to the voter. It's really not showing any respect for them. When you have somebody who doesn't even live there in there or having somebody paper, it's not how I want to portray my party, is trying to trick voters into voting for us. And we didn't want to play this game of, you know, splitting the vote and risk, you know, playing politics up there, which doesn't help people. And so our calculated decision was to sit back, let the parties that did have the viable candidate of that time fight it out and see what the results were. And the interesting thing was those who feared that we were going to split the vote um, on the left were obviously gobsmacked to find out that with a clear playing field, the NDP still couldn't actually pull it off. So, you know, in the future, we don't have to worry about that argument anymore <laughs> about splitting the vote. There's no vote to split because the NDP is not drawing people. And that's an argument for us to use in the future. But where what comes down to is I'd like to portray the party and ourselves as being moralistic, as being better than what we have. And I did not want to insult future voters and I wanted to pay the respect to the voters that's just saying simply, we didn't have the time, we couldn't find somebody that could properly represent you, vote for somebody who can up there, we'll let it go. And that's what we came down to, for better or worse. We got flack either way, <laughs> of course, you know, um, but it is what it is. And it's going to be the last time we do that. Obviously, we're much more entrenched now with our rebuild or whatnot. That's not going to be an issue going forward. But at the time, that it was what it was. I mean, it probably looks bad on us. And, you know, I, I accept that. And it's time to move forward. I have done roughly 300 interviews and you just gave me the most honest political answer I think I've done in my entire time <laughs> doing this show of, and the fact that you said you don't want to run paper candidates tells me a lot about you because I, 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 I preach at the top of my lungs on this show that if a candidate is on the ballot, they should live in the riding. They should live in the exactly. riding and they should be the, your neighbor. They should not be someone from Regina running in Athabasca or here in Calgary running up in Fort McMurray. They should be on the ground in the riding. So I appreciate that from you. And I think there's a lot of politicians who need to learn that motto from you. So I appreciate you just even saying it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. It's the truth. I mean, it really is. And, you know, we had some things and some people are saying, well, why don't I go up there and run? And I'm thinking, why? I don't live there. I don't, you know, I don't know the local politics there offhand. I'm up there on the ground. It's what would that say about me to do that? And again, that's not I am as a person. It's not what I want the party that I lead to be going in the future. It's just not something we want to be. You know, if we lose fair and square, but at least we can hold our head high that we did the moral thing. I'm good with that. During your leadership uh, listening tour that you did uh, after uh, October, did you make your way up to Athabasca? Did you talk to the people in Athabasca? We did not quite get there because COVID intervened. <laughs> and so we had the big shutdown of the province for the most part that it really did. I mean, the last thing I wanted to be is a super spreader, you know, going out to a place. And then you know, it's not the place you want to be when you're asking people to trust you with their votes. So we never quite got there. And that was one of the reasons too, right? We didn't have of the connections they're necessary for my team that's once we took over the party or whatnot and we just just wasn't there it's just too close to where we've been rebuilding we never quite got there and again 
it is what it is and I stand by the decision. And if anybody has a problem with that, they can call me. I, they have my phone number and we can chat about it. Um, I want to talk about COVID-19 because uh, we talk about the super spreader event that you, you didn't want to be that. That's great. But um, your province has gone the other way. Your uh, premier, Scott Moe, has announced that all the restrictions are lifted, mask mandates are done. Now, I am an avid reader of the Regina Leader Post, and I, I saw today's, I think it was today or yesterday's article where businesses are saying, nope, we're still requiring people to have masks in their office in, when they come in if they're using our business. Uh, I want to start off with the Scott Moe angle here, and that is, uh, was this too soon? Did did Scott Moe lift the mandates, the mask mandates, and the re uh, the sort of uh, protocols too soon, or do you think this was a, a, the appropriate time to do it? I think he made the calculated decision to appease a certain part of his base. Now, the interesting thing about that is, even with the polls coming out at that time, um, the majority of people did not want to necessarily have the mandates go away. And for anybody who has children understands that, that for us to send our children to school, when they take away any type of tracking, when they take away any type of um, communication that there could be other children in their classrooms or whatnot, it's not a place you want to be as a, <clears throat> as a family member. It's just, it's not there. So they made the calculated decision to do so against, against the advice of their own, you know, healthcare professionals and their own advisors. And it is what it is. But the problem with that is going back to how they've been treating COVID the whole time, there doesn't never seem to be any type of actual plan in place. It was always um, reactionary, ad hoc, whatever worked for the time, duct tape and screws type of thing, trying to put things together. And for people like myself and for people who like professionalism, it was tough to watch. And so getting rid of mandates and getting rid of um, even reporting now of actual COVID to once a week. Um, so much for informed decision, by the way. I can't make an informed decision if I have no information for myself and my family. But it was essentially something that if I was a professional, if I was, let's say, in finance, I, and I had somebody do that or I did that, I would be fired, you know, without having actual planning and foresight and actual a strategy to go along with it. Perhaps they did have a strategy and a plan, but they never let the public know. And so the implication is that it was just week by week, whatever they thought was best was done. And I just shake my head thinking that, you know, this is how my province that I love and my family is treated. That they can't even think about having some type of strategy or process that they can let us know so we can actually understand why these decisions are being made. So to me, it's just extraordinarily unprofessional. But the calculated decision was made, and I think a very political one, to go again to try and retrieve that base that they think, a part of the base they think is leaving them. And it's part and parcel more politics than it was any type of tangible strategy. So are you saying that you would have not removed the mask mandates and the uh, lifting of the COVID uh, reporting numbers? I just I just want clarification here because uh, I agree that uh, he did it politically, Scott Moe, as much as you might love him or hate him, he probably, he, people make political decisions all the time based on politics. It's that's why it's called politics. Um, but for you, would you have done anything differently? What would you have done if you were in Scott Moe's position? Well, from the get-go, I would have actually created, and I've been talking about this quite a bit to people, I would have created an advisory council of experts in the field to actually counsel and advise me. So I'm not in that position of contradicting my own medical health professional or you know somebody who is actually supposed to be shall we say, independent of governments, being basically pistol whipped by the premier and how they make decisions. So the very first thing I would do is that, and I would let them be my guide. Um, let's put it this way. Um, I am a university professor. I have some you know, expertise, but one of my non-expertise is medical decisions. So I would never presume to give medical advice to people because that's not my expertise. I go to a doctor for that. And so I would be much more comfortable having a doctor advise me on these things as I move forward. It doesn't mean I have to actually do what they say, but to have that advice and to project that to the population, the public, saying, this is what my advisory council is saying. If I agree with this, certain things I don't agree with, here's my decision. We never got that. So going back to what I would do, 
I would have that advisory council in place. And if they tell me, Jeff, this is the time where you can start segueing towards non-mandates, pulling back, then I would seriously consider it and I would tell and let the public know why I made that decision, aside from what we have now. And so it's difficult for me to say yes or no, black or white for that particular time they did it because we don't have the information as to why they did it to begin with. Yeah. It's simply what they decided on their own because they never came out and said, according to these experts, that's what they think. And it goes back to knowing your place. Nobody's an expert about everything. We all need advice. We're not gods. We all need advice from experts. And it's not shameful to ask expert, experts for advice. In fact, it shows prudence and wiseness to be able to do it. Um, I, I want to talk about sort of the the being between a rock and a hard place because you have one section of the population saying, yes, we need to lift mandates, we need to lift masking. And then you have another like yourself who's saying, okay, we need to be cautious about this. How do you balance that? I, I understand that you want an advisory committee, but you you would need to be able to talk to everyone. And as premier, you need to uh, represent everyone. So how do you do that? How would you do that? And how would the Saskatchewan liberals do that if in power or if they elect MLAs? where you are balancing not just the people who elected you, but the people who didn't as well. Right. And that's the catch. And so I'm glad you framed it that way because that's exactly what we're not seeing right now. <laughs> but, and you're right. How do you represent everybody? And the key is just informing people as to why the decisions are being made and allowing them to give their own input. I'm not saying that getting rid of mandates or whatever the case may be or vaccine passports is bad. What I'm saying is that we have to be able to articulate to the people we represent why we are doing the things we're doing and give them the opportunity to actually express themselves. So in this particular case, what we saw was a government and the premier simply just coming out saying this is it and that is that and that's the way it's going to be. Um, I'm sure people who like stern father figures that probably works very well. But if you're representing a population that doesn't necessarily agree with you and who is paying your salary, you should probably give them a little more explanation than that and allow them to rebut you in certain ways, give them that opportunity. And so if I and when I would make decisions, you're not going to please everybody. We all know that. And, you know, anti-maskers, anti-vaxxers, anti-mandate people may not like the idea of continuing for a little bit longer. But I would do my best to explain why I made the decision I did. And I would try and make it as common sense as possible. This is the right thing to do this moment. Here's why. And I would lay it out. And it's not saying it's going to appease them, but at least they know where I stand. At least they know where the decision is coming from. And they would have the chance to be able to express why what we're doing is wrong. To me, that is the very foundation of democracy. I, I feel like we could do a full hour on Saskatchewan's response to the COVID-19, but there are other topics <laughs> that I want to talk about. And one is one that is hitting a lot of, oh, I wouldn't say a lot of people, but everyone. And that is inflation. Inflation is a massive deal right now. People are paying more at the grocery stores. People are paying more at the pumps and people need relief. Um, how, how do we handle this uh, matter going forward because I, I think it's not just an Alberta issue it's not a Saskatchewan it's a Canadian issue and I know the Canadian government has its role to play but the provinces do as well what can Scott Mo do tomorrow in your words that can help people with the relief of the rising cost of living a bit of context I mean when you have a situation you have natural inflation every year right whether it's yeah. small or whether it's large it's going to happen and so for many of us who do not get corresponding raises every year to cover that, um, our purchasing power gets smaller and smaller. Uh, so that's a natural occurrence. That's just part and parcel of having, you know, political, political economy of what we have. And so it just become more exacerbated now by virtue of the supply chain issue, by virtue of, of course, the Ukraine war and just the pandemic in general, where it's become a little, you know, a much bigger issue than it would be perhaps year in, year out. But the issues and how we can deal with them are still the same. I mean, in Saskatchewan, we have one of the lowest minimum wages in the country. 1181 hasn't moved in years. And I'm not saying that raising to $15 an hour is something that um, will suddenly cure all ills. 
But even $15 an hour now um, is not necessarily corresponding. It's still close to poverty, <laughs> Ryan. And so we have to deal with an issue of how do we do this in a sensible way that doesn't actually cause more inflation. <laughs> That's probably the issue. But there's a lot of things that we can do to help. And so, I mean, the more extreme um, ideas, especially by virtue of gas and stuff, get rid of gas tax or whatnot um, very you know, quickly or you know, for ad hoc things, all those things can do temporarily. But we can do other things that more long term, and that's the smarter move. And that's something that with the SAS party that's in power right now, um, they're, they're small move people that they'll just react. And so uh, crisis happens, they react. If crisis happens, they react. There's no real long term thinking. So if we step back and ask ourselves, what can we do long term? There's a lot of things we can do. Um, for the very thing of, well, for income tax, and it's something I've been saying for a while, that the basic amount of income tax before we start paying income tax here is around $16,000 in Saskatchewan. And if we bump that up even to a minimum wage salary to about $22,000, that's three, four, five hundred dollars in somebody's pocket that they can actually buy diapers. They can buy more groceries and help them absorb the cost. And that's minimal effect to general revenue because people in that bracket are not putting their money in Swiss bank accounts. You know, they're not <laughs> hiding in their mattress. They're paying, they're putting it back into the economy. And so it's only going to stimulate the economy more and come back with other revenue sources such as our PST. So you're not really losing a whole lot revenue wise, but yet you're giving people a little bit of a bump in their purchasing power to be able to help absorb those costs. So something like that, very simple, that, and it boggles the mind that governments don't think of this, but I kind of understand with regard to where we are, the NDP, that's not their thing, the SAS party, they don't really deal with um, people below the poverty line very well. So it is what it is. But that's one thing. Another thing too is take PSD off of certain items, insurance items. If you mandate somebody to buy something, it's probably the most insulting thing in the world to charge them extra for it. So house insurance, for example, we have to buy it. Or car insurance, we have to buy it. Why would we charge extra tax for something that's mandatory? To me, that doesn't make sense. Also for household now, just, items. Just on that note, just on insurance, I, yes. I, I just read this article. I know I read this article this morning, but SGI rebates are getting mailed out here soon. So people will be getting yeah. a rebate on their SGI, which uh, for anyone who's listening outside of the province of Saskatchewan, SGI is the Saskatchewan government insurance, basically car insurance and all that fun stuff. So they are giving some money back to homeowners and but insurance. In that case, it's the short-term thinking again. Right. Yeah. That's just a quick check. It's not anything that's institutional that's going to last. So we're trying to think of things that will actually help people year in, year out, not just because the government's getting a little nervous that people are getting angry about inflation. So they hand out hundred dollar checks, right? Buying them off with their own money. But we're thinking of longer term solutions that can help. And that's another thing that we can do. Just take PSD off of even just necessities such as diapers or female products. I mean, those things at a certain point, they were actually on the list when we first instituted PSD, saying there's no way we're going to put PSD on these things because you need them. Well, guess what? You know, 15 years down the line, there you go. So for tax-wise, there's a lot of things that we can actually do that are just doesn't cost as much to general revenue, but certainly means a lot to somebody who's making minimum wage or even up to $15. And that's just something that will be more institutional down the road than just a $100 rebate check. So... That's just some ideas. We can go on all day about ideas of how we can do this. And there's plenty. It's just the will to for a government or even a party to even want to push these things forward. When you're in power, probably the scariest thing is to try and implement something and have it fail. So it's best sometimes to do nothing and hand out money and checks than it is to actually think outside the box. Um, Saskatchewan, like Alberta, is one of the most prosperous uh, country uh, provinces when it comes to natural resources. In Saskatchewan, you have potash, you have uh, uranium, you have oil and gas as well, not as much as Alberta, but you do have oil and gas. What is the Saskatchewan Liberals' position on the natural resources that are in Saskatchewan today? And uh, with everything going on in Ukraine, and I hate to bring up international issues on a provincial show, but it, it, it does affect us at the end of the day. How, how, what is your position? What is the Saskatchewan Liberals' position on getting that, uh, those resources to market? Well, the resources, of course, are important for our economy. There's no denying that. Um, but I think that where we're going now as a province and as a world, um, as the earth in itself, um, I mean, most countries, aside, I mean, 
I should probably back up. The Ukraine-Russia war has kind of obscured um, a lot of things that were very progressive that's happened with regard to the world economy, especially the resource economy. Not too long ago in Scotland, you know, a good majority of first world countries came together and decided to phase out right, fossil fuels or phase out um, non-renewables um, by 2040. And that's something that the Canadian government is trying to describe to as well and sinking money into. And it's something that is incremental and doable, but also something essential. We can't live off of our oil and gas forever. That's just reality. And so it is time that we probably put our big boy pants on and start to think about something that we can do for the future. Now, that's not saying I'm going to somehow, if I'm ever premier, go in there and say, okay, it's green transition time. We're going to cut everything off. Oh, we're going to fire all you people from SAS power or whatnot, and we're going to go this way. That's how people like to sell it because it's ridiculously. Um, it's the narrative, diversity. right? It's the narrative exactly. that people are able to sell to people. And I, I agree that that narrative is wrong for a lot of parties that are out there. That's right. And I think that at a certain point, we have to have what we can say a coming to Jesus moment that we are going to have to transition some way or another. We can't live with 20th century, you know, a 20th century um, energy sector anymore. We can't live with a 20th century economy anymore. It's time that we have to, have to start thinking outside the box, have to start thinking about the future and doing it in a way that we can actually be more prosperous and not have it be, um, shall we say, detrimental to us. And there's ways we can do that. And there's many things that we can do. So going back to your question about the energy sector and about natural resources, it's important for Saskatchewan and we can continue to do that as we slowly segue into something different. But at a certain point, that segue has to happen and it will happen. It can be very painful because it has to happen very quickly because we've waited too long or we can start doing it smartly now. The benefit of doing it now is we get all of the benefits of doing it. That it's a market that is still very open. It's an economy that's still very new. We can dictate how it's done. We can become leaders, not followers. And in that particular case, watch our economy grow and watch everything else that comes with it. We already have storms out there, as I can see. We already have problems with our agriculture having droughts. We can tangibly see the problems with our own eyes now. It's time to step up. It's time to do a property. It's time to go into the 21st century. Come celebrate Calgary's favorite cocktail. Calgary Caesar Fest is taking place on May 19th and 20th right here in the birthplace of Canada's official national cocktail. As listeners and viewers of the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown, you will receive 20% off your tickets when you use the promo code CBI Caesars. That's C-B-I Caesars, all one word. Just visit CalgaryCaesarFest.com and get your tickets today. You've talked about narrative a few times, and I mentioned it there briefly. How do you change the narrative? Because let's be honest, and I am gonna, this is a bit of a tangent, and I apologize for this, but I, I want to get your reaction. But we we have a certain political leaning group that says if you're not with us, you're against us. Basically, if you if you if you're not voting for us, they're going to shut down your job tomorrow, and they're going to change their way. You can you can say whatever you want, but that part that group will say nope, they're going to shut you down. Green energy, new world, all that. How do you fight that narrative? And let's be honest, you have a governing party who is kind of popular right now in Saskatchewan. The polls are showing a bit different, uh, a bit of a dip, but. They, they are saying, if you're not with us, you're against us in the resource sector. So how do you change that narrative to get people to understand that, no, we're not against it. We're, we, we, we support this, this industry. How do you do that? Well, a number of ways. Uh, first, it's just blanket communication. It's actual marketing campaigns. It's actually talking with such things as the Saskatchewan um, Chamber of Commerce, who actually just released a report that almost mirrors exactly what I was just talking about. The interest is there. The problem is, is that the louder group tends to own the narrative because they're in power right now. My classic case is that there is a 
certain broadcasting company in Saskatchewan that donates all, well, as much as they possibly can to the SAS party. And what they get back, of course, is all the marketing dollars and advertising dollars from the SAS party. And then they blare and trumpet the SAS party deeds and minimize everything else. But going back to where we are for the SAS or SAS liberals is we just have to essentially reclaim it by marketing ourselves better, by going out there and explaining it better. We can't cede our narrative to the SAS party and those in the media that like the SAS party. We can't cede them territory and presume that somehow people are going to take us seriously and listen to us. So it's really going in there and explaining. It's going into shows such as this. It is actually spending money to actually market and advertise properly. Now, the question is that is that the NDP all this time as the official opposition has had the resources to be able to do this or whatnot. And for me, I'm still gobsmacked that despite having a bullhorn or whatnot, that they seem so inefficient in doing what they're doing. And that just comes down to, in many ways, being too ideological. So there's not much they can say about the economy or taxation that would appeal to people from the center or even center right that would want to go in to vote for them. We don't have that issue, right? We're socially, well, progressive, but also fiscally conservative in certain ways. We know money doesn't grow in trees, so we have to be smart about it. And that's to us, is the way to go through common sense. But really it comes down to just good old fashioned retail politics. That's what it comes down to. And not everybody's gonna agree with you. People are still gonna hate you. I'm still gonna get death threats on a daily basis, but I don't care. I'm there to try and tell people and let people know what we can do to help their lives be better. And if they choose to go with us, that's terrific. If not, we accept that that's not something that they want. Okay, I, I, I'm just gobsmacked here for a second. I just want to make sure that I heard you correctly and my listeners do as well and my viewers. Did you just say you get death threats on a daily basis? Um, not as much this week. <laughs> uh, during the trucker convoy, there was quite a bit of that. And it was really came down to being associated as being a liberal, but also um, when there was a trucker rally on February 5th at the legislature, um, I had actually had a rally of my own <laughs> at the legislature where we got permits and stuff, and we were there to voice our concern about the lifting of mandates at the end of the month because we weren't told why this was being ha happening. So we'd organize this, and then, of course, a day later, the trucker convoy decides that they're going to have their rally at the same place at the same time. And so once it came to that point where they thought we were counter protesting, which we weren't, then we got the backlash to that. So there was a lot of unsavoriness. There was a heavy police presence, of course, and things went as planned for us. We were allowed to do what we did. Uh, we weren't going to back down because some people were mean to us. And we did what we did, but it comes with the territory. Right? It's um, a little more extreme. We've kind of Americanized our politics in a way, but it is what it is. People... There's keyboard warriors that feel safe behind a computer thinking they can do what they want. And, you know, if that's how retail politics or politics in general works. And if people think of you enough to want to hate you that badly, then obviously you're making a name for yourself and you're you know, triggering them in a certain way. So it's not the worst thing in the world. But I mean, there's a difference between emails and of course actually somebody attempting to do it. So we're not, yeah. we haven't quite jumped that shirt yet, but yes. Um, long, I, a long answer, but I want to give you a little bit of context as to how this kind of got amped up. That's well, I, I hope you're safe, and I hope and I, I, this, you, you've, hit, you've hit a nerve with me because you mentioned keyboard warriors, and I, I hate social media. I despise it. It's great because you and I connected that way, and I was able to send you an That's email true. and able to find out that way. And I agree there is a good part of social media, but the keyboard warriors, the negativity, the division, the polarization of our politics on social media has become so abhorrent that I just, I can't believe people are sending death threats to you. And I just, I wish people would stop. Just have a conversation with somebody. So get out from behind the, so the good old Twitter and Facebook. Um, the last question I want to talk, uh, the last uh, sort of area I want to talk about is um, Ukraine. Now, I was not going to mention it, but I, I, I do my research right before I come on and I, I checked your Twitter feed just to make sure I didn't miss anything. And you, uh, three hours ago from recording this, uh, you posted that you had wrote 
uh, Minister of Immigration and Citizenship uh, for the federal government, Sean Frazier, uh, a letter to create a Saskatchewan Special Immigration Initiative for Ukraine refugees. Now, why is this important? I understand that Saskatchewan has the highest population of Ukraine residents in the country of Canada. Why is this important to create a special immigration initiative, though? Well, precisely because of the context you mentioned, but we also have the means to be able to do so. Now, it's something many people perhaps aren't familiar with, but during the height of um, the fourth wave of the pandemic, we created this infrastructure where we have um, certain warehouses of beds, stockpiled certain things for emergencies, precisely for the pandemic. We started to decommission these after um, the fourth wave. But the plans are still there, the means are still there, and all of the resources are still there. Ergo, we have emergency places for refugees if we so fit. We are ready for it. And so in my personal perspective, 13% of our population has a certain connection or history of the Ukraine. We're, we've always been. In fact, we do already have a special council for uh, the government of Saskatchewan that is hooked up with the Ukraine to show that cultural connection. I think Roy Romano actually was the first to create this. So we've always been a team with the Ukraine. And how much better can we support Ukraine? How much better can we support um, or support their fight against obvious you know, unwanted and sickening aggression at this particular point than to do something tangible? Like going back to the keyboard words, it's nice to tweet and say, oh, we support Ukraine. But the question is, what do we as people, what can we do about it? This is something we can do. The only thing that's missing, well, there's two things that are missing. One, the government of Saskatchewan, the SAS party government, the ruling government, to actually want to do something more substantial, to be able to work with the federal government, which is used as the straw man of everything that's wrong, to have this happen. And two, to get the resources that the federal government can provide to be able to make this a possibility. So it takes two to tango in this way. So what I've been trying to do is create that narrative so they can tango together so that we can do something tangible. And it's not something that's pie in the sky. We have everything in place to be able to do this properly. We just need both sides to get together and make it a reality. I appreciate that. And I just cautious of time here. So we're going to sort of do our wrap up here. And my, 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 the million dollar question, I think I've had about three of these already during the show, but uh, the million dollar question going forward is what's next? What's next for the Saskatchewan Liberals? You are almost six months into your uh, leadership. Uh, what what do you do now moving forward? Restrictions are slow, slowing down. People are getting more comfortable meeting in groups again. What do you have to do to get the message out there that the Saskatchewan Liberals are back? Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. We actually have a policy convention in Saskatoon on March 26th. And the whole point of that, of course, is to bring all of our policies into the 21st century, what I've been talking about this whole time, modernizing everything, so we have a message to sell. We have a message to bring to people that saying this is what we're about. And so that's March 26th, starting in April, we have our first marketing campaign that's gonna come out and we're literally gonna be starting to hit the streets and campaigning. We're literally gonna bring it to the people, not just me, right? Our party is going to do that. And so we're gonna be spending the next couple of years up until 2024, literally campaigning, literally letting the people know, Saskatchewan know who we are now, what we're about now, what we can do for you now, and how we can make everybody's life better. And so that is our, our stamp, our campaign in a nutshell. We are literally going to do this in a couple months or less. And so that's really where we're at. It took us a good six months, as you mentioned, to get to this point, to build up the infrastructure, reconnect, you know, draw those networks again to be able to do this. And it's only going to get stronger as we go forward. And so we're all in in 2024. There's not going to be any gimmies like the Athabasca by-election. We're going to go for it. And we're going to make a legitimate chance and shot to give people that third option. There were 48% of people sitting out with what they were looking for in 2020. That's our what we're going to be doing in a nutshell going forward. So what's the metrics you're putting in place? As a, as a business owner myself, I always put in metrics to make sure I'm successful. And say a year's time from now in 2023, I'm going to call you up and say, hey, Jeff, 
what have you done to make sure that you are ready for 2024 and you have that uh, that support in uh, place? So what are the metrics you're going to be putting in place so that way you are a successful leader, but the Saskatchewan party does, uh, the Saskatchewan liberals, sorry, um, have that opportunity to be that third alternative? And that's a good thing. And of course, there's metrics there, right? But it's, we're strategists. So of course, we're going to have that, you know. But we have like best case scenario, worst case scenario, whatnot. But generally speaking, um, a success for us for 2024 is you know, having all candidates and all 61 writings, legitimate candidates. I'm not running any paper. I made that very clear. So all 61 candidates. So if somebody wants to vote for a liberal, no matter where they are in this province, they can. Uh, we would, of course, want to get at least 5 to 10% of the vote. Um, why that's important for us is because in 2020, we had, I think, 0.08% of the vote. So getting 5 to 10% of the vote is a major accomplishment. It really is. It's a good step forward. And we would like to have at least one MLA to represent us in the legislature. Like, that is the tangible reality. And of course, the question is, well, why are you running if you don't think you can form government? Because I'm a realist and recognizing that the odds of going from three candidates and 300 votes from 2020 to forming government in 2024, it's not likely to happen. Not impossible, but not likely. And I'm not going to, again, lie to someone's face and have false bravado about it. If it happens, I'm ecstatic, but it is what it is. Again, I use that phrase a lot, but that's just me being realistic. But Really, the long game is 2028. 2024 is us reasserting ourselves. And 2028 is really the long game where we think, as we keep moving forward, that we have a good shot of at least being tangible enough to perhaps form government, or at least be loyal opposition. 2024 is us really asserting ourselves as a major party again and having people be comfortable enough to vote liberal once again. We can't just snap our fingers and make that happen. So we're realists about this. and. That's what we look at. And if anybody has a problem thinking that I'm underselling it, prove me wrong. Vote for us in, and then I'll call you up and say, look, I was totally wrong. We're government now. Uh, my bad. <laughs> but you know, we are trying to be to the point where we don't disappoint. And if we disappoint by overselling, that could doom us in the future. And that's not what we want to do. So I wouldn't be doing my job. And I know this is two years out, and this is probably not even close to being on your radar. But I would not be doing my job with, uh, if I didn't ask the million, this million dollar question is, which riding are you going to run in? Which riding are you looking at to run in in the 2024 election? Because you need a seat as well, and you need to start door knocking in your riding to get your name out there as well. Yeah, we do have a couple options. I would I can say for 100 degree, 100 percent certainty, it will be in Regina. That's where I live. And again, I live here, so I'm not going to pretend that somehow I live in Athabasca, as I mentioned before. Now, the good thing is I've lived a couple places in Regina, so I can, with a straight face, tangibly go into that place and represent. Um, there's two or three that we're thinking about, but most likely I'll still be running in the seat that I currently live in and what I ran in 2020, which is Regina Northeast. That's the most likely scenario. So I'd say if I was a betting person, that'd be it. So I guess I'm saying point blank. Yeah, that's the writing I'm going to be going. <laughs> you and heard it here first. Breaking news. There you go. <laughs> um, there you go. I mean, it, it's a more conservative um, constituency. There's no doubt about it. But you know what? That's why I have two years to try and convince people that I'm the right person for it. And if they do not choose me, I respect that. But um, I'm not going to go down without any type of fight. In me. I think I've shown so far that I will do what I say. And so we'll see what happens. Um, Jeff, I want to thank you. This has been enlightening and fun and exciting. I, I, I miss uh, Saskatchewan politics so much. I'm, I'm trying to break into it. I'm trying to bring on more guests from Saskatchewan. Uh, and I appreciate you taking time out of your uh, afternoon and day and sitting down and chatting with me because democracy can only happen when you have the conversation. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. I really do appreciate it, too. And um, I like your open mindedness with regard to conversation. And you know, it's people like you that make media what it should be. And that's the nonpartisan asking the true questions and not making presumptions. So thank you. No worries. So for everyone here, actually, before I wrap up, I should say, if you want to learn more about the party, if you want to learn more about the Saskatchewan Liberals uh, and uh, Jeff, 
links to his social media and their website are in the show notes. So if you're watching this on YouTube, scroll down. There it is. If you're listening to this on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your shows, go back and scroll down. You'll find all the links to their social media pages as well. With that, for everyone here at the Crossboard Interviews with Chris Brown, have yourself an excellent rest of your day. And remember, guys, just keep talking. Have a conversation. Get out from behind Twitter and social media and have a conversation with somebody. Talk to you later.